Hello everyone, my name is Danny Eckert, Associate Professor here at, uh, at Neura, uh, and I'm going to be talking about uh, sleep and mental health, two things that are intimately linked as part of Neura Talks. This really is uh, a major impact on, on health and well-being, that is sleep. Uh, if you don't get enough of it, you feel miserable, or if you've got a sleep disorder, it really does affect every organ in the body. So you might ask yourself, what does sleep have to do with mental health? And really the answer is everything, as I'll show you in the next few minutes. So why should you mind your sleep? Well, sleep really isn't a waste of time. Uh, it's up there with the three pillars of health, with exercise, diet, uh, and healthy living in general. Sleep is one of those modifiable things that we really can uh, uh, prioritize to have uh, uh, live healthy and productive lives. So you, as, I, as I alluded to at the start, you know, what, what, has, uh, what has sleep got to do with mental health? Really, uh, it, it affects every, every uh, aspect. Uh, poor sleep is a key symptom of depression and mania. Poor sleep can trigger depression, anxiety disorder and burnout. Uh, and sleep deprivation can also uh, evoke uh, psychotic uh, experiences and episodes. So the two are, are really intimately linked, and these are just a, a few examples of many. We know that uh, young uh, women who do not uh, sleep well uh, are much more likely to be depressed uh, into adulthood. So I'm just going to run through a few questions now, asking uh, uh, the viewers to think about what, what do you know about sleep? Um, so if you think about this simple question, how many times do you think a healthy 20-year-old individual wakes up per hour of sleep? So I've listed, listed a few choices here, uh, and I'll ask the audience members, uh, hands up those that think you'd wake up zero times per hour would be quite normal for a 20-year-old. Yep, so a couple. Uh, B, one to five, yep, a few there, uh, five to ten, one or two, ten to twenty, no takers for that one, more than twenty, okay, so most people said either zero or one to five. If we look here, this uh, is the accumulation of, of several studies uh, and, the, uh, and the large uh, thick black line through the center tells you how many times uh, people typically wake up per hour of sleep. So if, if the example, with the example if I get, if we go down and look at age of the 20 year old on the, on the bottom axis there, and you go across and you see it's in between 10 and 15. So the correct answer to this would be D. Uh, in fact, no one in the audience answered that, uh, that question. So quite normal to wake up for five or 10 seconds at a time and go back to sleep. So it is this dynamic thing uh, that's occurring and we don't even realize we're having these multiple awakenings. As I'll tell you, if you do have a, a sleep disorder, very often that number will be elevated. We can see with age, it's also quite normal, healthy, to, to wake up up to 20 times per hour uh, into older age. Uh, and the opposite is also true in that kids uh, very rarely wake up. So how many hours uh, do you typically sleep per night? So just, I just ask everyone to think about that for a little moment. On average, how many hours across the week would you, would you typically sleep? So a show of hands in the audience, uh, those who are getting less than five hours uh, per night on average. Yep, a couple of takers. Uh, five to six hours per night. Yep, quite a few there. Uh, who's getting six or seven hours per, per night? Yep, that majority. Uh, seven to eight hours, yep, some, so, uh, eight to nine, couple, and over, over nine hours, one or two. Okay, so if you look at this, now it turns out that your sleep duration is actually a predictor of, for many uh, health outcomes, but if you look at the, the most obvious and the most serious, you can see it's this U-shaped curve. So this is your... Um, uh, relative risk of, of, of dying prematurely, if you like. So we can see that the optimum hour of sleep for an adult is seven to eight hours per night. Uh, anything less than that, particularly if you're getting less than six hours a night, so those of you that answered uh, A or B, the chances are you're 30 or 40 percent more likely to die uh, earlier than those that are getting uh, seven or eight hours a night on a regular basis. 
Now, interestingly, the opposite is also true, and this may be linked to mental health issues. Those who sleep uh, a particularly long uh, amount, uh, that is greater than nine hours per night, also have an ele elevated risk uh, for reasons we don't fully understand. Here are the recommendations across the lifespan from the National Sleep uh, Foundation uh, in terms of average hours per night. And you can see, as reflected there, a young adult uh, and also uh, an adult up to the age of uh, 64 years, seven to nine hours is the recommendation. A little bit less, only, only marginally, however, if uh, into older age. Um, but if you look here, uh, school age and, and teenagers, if you take the teenage example, eight to 10 hours is the recommendation for teenagers for optimal health, performance, uh, and growth and development. Uh, a recent survey showed that only 15% of adults, uh, sorry, of teenagers are getting that eight hours of sleep uh, as a minimum. So this is, you know, profoundly a major, major issue uh, in our communities. Not enough sleep. And as I already mentioned, uh, there's strong data in young women, if they're not getting enough sleep, this leads into a, about a six times elevated risk of depression uh, in, in, later in life. So why do we sleep? Well, many reasons. Uh, body homeostasis, cleaning up the brain, restoring energy supplies. It's vital for uh, creating new memories and consolidating existing memories, uh, creating and strengthening neural connections in the brain. Certain hormones are only released uh, during sleep. Uh, growth hormone, for example, is only released uh, during deep sleep. These are some of the th reasons. It's, it's the best elixir you could possibly have. Uh, this is every night we go off to sleep. It's the best medicine you can possibly have. It's fascinating. If you think about sleep uh, across species, um, uh, seals and uh, uh, dolphins and so forth, they can actually sleep with half their brain uh, completely awake, the other half is, is, is asleep, as shown in this example here. Uh, so one side is actually the blue side there, is completely deep asleep, and the other is, is uh, very fast activity on the EEG waves indicating alertness uh, and, and, and an awake state. We're now learning about this in humans too, and there are regions of the brains that can go offline when others are still operating. Not quite to the extent where you shut off a whole hemisphere, but nonetheless, uh, we are learning about this local sleep phenomenon, and it might be quite important for a range of, uh, of disorders. Here's the analogy. If you think about this, if you are consistently not getting enough sleep, imagine if you're trying to, to come home every night, cook in, the, in a kitchen that looks like this. It is a cumulative effect. This adds up. Sleep deprivation adds up, leads to inflammation, stress on the body. If you try to come into this kitchen and cook, it's just too hard to do it. It mounts up over time uh, if you're not going to sleep and cleaning up the garbage every night, if you like. It is, it is the same pretty much as a garbage truck coming through, picking up the dirty pieces uh, and giving that brain a wash every single night so that it's ready to go the next morning. The same is true if you're uh, in an office setting Pile, uh, the papers pile up, if you're not clearing away the setting, getting that sleep, you really can't function well uh, and optimise your performance uh, and, uh, and act uh, uh, well at, at your uh, optimal. Recent report uh, we released uh, as part of the Australasian Sleep Association, the Sleep Health Foundation, uh, uh, commissioned by uh, uh, Deloitte's, 40% of Australians are getting inadequate sleep. Uh, this was a big uh, study or report launched in, in, in Parliament House by the Health Minister. One person, uh, over one person is dying every single day from accidents, either in the workplace or in the uh, uh, travelling to work and so or from home from work because they're not getting enough sleep. Now the, uh, the costs associated with this are really astonishing, unlike any other uh, uh, issue in the, in the community. $66 billion a year was the estimated cost last year alone of inadequate sleep to the Australian community. And as you can see from the breakdown here, some of these are only a small proportion in fact is health related costs. The rest are related to lost productivity, uh, other financial costs and this loss of well-being which is another quantifiable component which contributes 60% uh, of the cost uh, associated with inadequate sleep of our community. So what keeps us from sleeping? Well, there's a range of things that potentially can get in the way. Uh, some of those relate to uh, common sleep disorders. At, at least a million and a half Australian adults have uh, these sleep disorders, sleep apnea, insomnia, restless leg syndrome. 
uh, other health conditions such as pain, cancer, uh, other, other issues uh, that, that can cause sleep disruption uh, are also quite prominent in the community. And of course in today's 24 hour society there's all sorts of reasons to keep us awake. 70% of Australians are shift workers, uh, which obviously also can have an impact on our sleep-wake cycle. So there's some behavioural influences there as well. Here's some examples of that pictorially. Um, and this is another one that's often underappreciated. Uh, as uh, uh, most of us live in, in the big cities around the world, including here in Australia, uh, cost of living is increasing to live uh, close to the city and the workplace. Uh, and so commute times are going up. People are, are living further away from the city centre. Congestion is a major issue. And that commuting time, both on the early end of the day and the, and the tail end of the day, is cutting into sleep time. People are having to get up earlier. When they get home, they may want to spend time with their family. Uh, I'm sure, of course, they do. And, uh, and, and perhaps a little bit of relaxation. So what tends to suffer is the sleep time. We as sleep scientists know how detrimental that is, but it is a factor in... Uh, uh, in our society and particularly in big cities. These are a huge problem. Having these phones up near the eyes is, is a real major issue. They emit blue light, they reset the body clock and they suppress melatonin which is the natural hormone that's released prior to going to sleep that sends us off to sleep. So basically with having these things up, up close to your eyes before you go to sleep is telling the body time to wake up and get going. Obviously the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. Coffee uh, uh, and stimulants, um, big part of today's society. Uh, those, particularly in the afternoon, major uh, alerting effect um, in uh, diminishing adenosine in the central nervous system, which actually is, is, is one of the sleep uh, regulators. So we don't want to have uh, coffee late in the day uh, uh, at all, all costs. We've got all sorts of other influences. We're, uh, in, in our, we're all thinking with today's 24-hour society. There's all various other reasons that can, can keep us up. And there's still, unfortunately, this perception of you know, these, these myths out there where you hear uh, it can be in our politicians and leaders that say, look, I can get behind four hours a night. It's simply a fallacy. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's harming them. And if they are doing that, it really is killing them. Uh, and they're making poor decisions along the way. So we've got to get rid of that persona that uh, you know, it's somehow superhuman to, uh, to not sleep uh, uh, enough. But to summarise all this, poor sleep impact, impact mental health. We've all had you know, one night of sleep where, we haven't, um, where we've had inadequate sleep or disrupted sleep. We know at least the poor concentration, uh, poor memory, uh, poor creativity, poor practice productivity and you're less resilient to stresses uh, that you may be faced with. Your amygdala is 60% more reactive. And just to put some numbers around this, if you're awake for 80, uh, 19 hours in a row, you're performing as though your uh, blood alcohol equivalent is 0.05. You stay awake for 24 hours, it's now 0.1. So you are legally intoxicated. You become, you're much more likely to become emotionally unstable, impulsive and, and poor judgment. In the longer term, these things add up. You've got increased risk of de developing depression, anxiety disorder, uh, and, and indeed suicidal behaviour. Depression and insomnia, the two are intimately linked in both directions. Uh, insomnia can be a, a trigger for depression bouts, and certainly depression can affect sleep and cause insomnia, or the opposite in some people, so it affects sleep. 80% of people with depression have insomnia, so the, these are intimately linked. Thankfully, there are some interventions. Cognitive behavioural therapy uh, is better than, than uh, sleeping pills in terms of getting rid of uh, uh, insomnia, and this can also uh, help with depressive symptoms as well. Sleep and mental health, I've already alluded to that. Is it the chicken and the egg? The, two, the, the, the reality is they're both linked. Um, but the exciting part of that is um, if we identify sleep problems, target them appropriately, and that might need a sleep physician involved, you can actually uh, have some benefits on the underlying mental health uh, issue. What we focus in here at, at our, in our sleep and uh, breathing uh, lab at Neura uh, is this condition, this very common condition of, of obstructive sleep apnea. Over a million Australian adults have this condition uh, and most of, of whom are undiagnosed. Two to two, to two and a half times more likely to have depression if you've got untreated severe sleep apnea, moderate to severe sleep apnea. Uh, and thankfully though, treatment, uh, if adhered to, can improve some of these depressive symptoms. 
We know that the main treatment, again developed here in Australia, continuous positive airway pressure therapy is very effective in, in treating sleep apnea if you're able to adhere. Many aren't, so we focus in at the lab on trying to help those people as well as those uh, who do go on to successfully uh, be treated with CPAP. So to do that, we try to understand why people are getting their sleep apnea. We use some detailed methodology that we've developed to understand that. Uh, and as such, as we've learned more about why people get sleep apnea and the four causes that we've identified, uh, we're developing new tailored therapies to the individual. So this is a really exciting time for, for the field of, uh, of sleep medicine. And we're also looking at other groups, um, how we can improve sleep, sleep um, to improve some of the common symptoms and disorders such central nervous system disorders such as multiple sclerosis where fatigue is a major issue and other mental health disorders such as schiz uh, schizophrenia uh, where sleep apnea and sleep disturbance is a major major issue uh, and we're starting to intervene there to try and uh, treat these individuals to help them with uh, manage their uh, disease or their disorder. So how can you improve your sleep more generally? Remembering four out of 10 Australians are not getting enough. The first thing to do is recognize that this is an important area and to prioritize your sleep. Sleep hygiene is crucial. And by that I mean uh, regular sleep pattern, winding down and relaxing routines, avoiding those uh, devices uh, for at least two hours before going to sleep, avoiding caffeine in the afternoons, Avoiding large meals, uh, alcohol uh, close to bedtime, which can have uh, disruptive effects on sleep, particularly in the second half of the night, uh, and optimizing the sleep environment. You want a dark, quiet environment. Uh, and if you do suspect that you might have a sleep disorder, then really taking the initiative and going and talking to your doctor about that is really the uh, first step to a happier, healthier life uh, by improving your sleep. So don't forget, sleep is not a waste of time. It really is crucial for optimal performance, productivity and health. A good night's sleep really is, is the, uh, the way to move forward in terms of creativity, productivity, concentration and your ability to be resilient and bounce back from adversity. So improving can sleep certainly can improve your mental health and general health uh, more broad, broadly. Here are some links that you might want to follow up on uh, in terms of minding your sleep. It's certainly worthwhile. Sleep Health Foundation, Australasian Sleep Association and the Harvard uh, uh, Healthy Sleep Resources. Thank you very much.